Hello everybody and welcome to yet another contemporary math lesson. In this lesson I will be going over section 8a where we talk about growth. Linear versus exponential growth to be exact. And I start out with a very interesting question here. Would you rather receive $1 million right now or one penny a day that doubles each day thereafter for 30 days. And so just to give you an idea, you get one penny today, two pennies tomorrow, um, four pennies the next day, eight pennies the next day, so on, so on, so on. And a lot of you out there have probably already heard this problem before and know which one you should choose. If so, fantastic, good for you. For making the right choice. But for those of you that may not know what's going on, this is what the difference between linear and exponential is. Which one of these is the better deal? Now, the human brain is not very well equipped to understand how exponential growth works. Uh, our brains are very much linear based. So to give you an idea as to what is going on, with exponential versus linear here, we have a little graphing uh, example that we need to do. And for right now, I just want to concentrate on values that are zero and bigger for the x value. So all of our independent values will be zero or larger. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. And we're going to do the same thing over here for our x's of the exponential function. And I can tell this is exponential because it has an exponent. So let's see, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So when I substitute these values in for x here, it'll just ultimately be two times whatever value I'm substituting in. No problem. I can multiply numbers by two all day. Two times zero is zero. Two times one is two. Two times two is four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14. Now, since we have an x and a y that corresponds with that x, these all now are viewable as ordered pairs. So why don't we graph these? So I have 0, 0 right here, 1, 2, 1 to the right, 2 up, 2, 4, 4, 6, I'm sorry, 3, 6, 4, 8, 5, 10, uh, 6, 12, and 7, 14. And I'm willing to bet that even if you didn't write over here 8 and then the corresponding y value, that we could figure out where it's supposed to go. For every one unit we jump to the right, we're moving up 2. So if I jump 1 to the right, I should move up 2, which would put me right there at 8. 16. All right, now let's do the same thing for our exponential function over here. I want to substitute this value for x into a power. So this will bring it back. Remember, any non-zero base to a zero power is going to be 1. If I substitute 1, in here, that's 2 to the first power is 2. If I substitute 2 in here, 2 to the second power is 4. If I substitute 3 in for the exponent, 2 to the third power is 8. 2 to the fourth power is 16. 2 to the fifth power is 32. And I'm just going to stop there. If you take a look at this last y value we calculated, 32, that is way off our y scale. 
it's not even, we can't graph it. It'd be way up there. So I'm going to take the time to graph these four, or these five points right now. So there are the red points. And yes, there are a couple overlaps right here with the one, two, and the two, four. You can see both of those points show up in both tables. All right, so uh, I will draw, uh, connect all of these black dots together and connect all of the red dots together so you can see the differences in what the graphs look like. So here are the graphs all connected. And I also have this little blue bar here. This is going to serve kind of like a just a straight edge for right now. And I made this little blue bar so you can see exactly how much faster an exponential function grows outside of a, outside of a linear function. So again, the exponential here is in red, and the linear graph is in black. So here we go. If you take a look at the zero coordinate, zero x value for both, you can see that the linear is at zero and the exponential is at one. So right off the bat, exponential is bigger than the linear function. But then you take a look at the next two, two points, the y values are exactly the same. You really don't start seeing the exponential growth being better or larger than the linear until you get over here to x equals 3. Right here you can see that the red graph at this point is above the black graph. So what that means is that the y value here is bigger than the y value here. And that just really means that the, the red graph is going to grow faster. It's even more pronounced if you go over one more. When you look at x equals 4, the red graph is now way above the black graph. For the linear function, when x equals 4, it's just at 8. But the growth of the exponential function put it all the way up to 16 which is huge. This y value is much, much larger than this y value. So the exponential growth grows so much faster. Let's just compare a couple other numbers here with these. Uh, when the exponential uh, function has an x value of 6, it's 64. And when the x value is 7, it's 128. And just take a look at the difference between these two numbers right here when x is 7. The result for the exponential function grows a lot faster than the linear function. That's what uh, the point we're trying to make here is. So let's move down, and I'll get my uh, ruler out of the way here. There we go. So what we end up calling this growth by doubling. And this is a characteristic of any quality that exhibits exponential growth. And we just call this growth, growth by doubling because if you come back and look at all these y values, like this one says uh, 4, we double it to get 8, we double it to get 16, we double it to get 32, so on and so on and so on. And that has to do with what the base is. The base was 2, so we will double each time. So examples of exponential growth include compound interest, cancerous tumors, human population growth, rabbit population, and much, much more. To see yet another example of how uh, linear and exponential growth are compared to each other, let's suppose that Constant Town and Power Town both have an initial population of 10,000 people. Constant Town grows at a constant rate of 500 people per year, where P 
power town grows at a constant rate of 5% per year. So we will use the graph to compare the populations of constant town and power town. So for constant town, we have an initial population of 10,000. And after one year, we can add 500 people. So we're at 10,500. After another year, we can add another 500 people. And that's 11,000. But if you look down here, our number of years jumps by five. Well, I don't want to keep having to add 500 people each time. I bet this would be better suited as an equation. So as an equation for constant town, why don't we call it uh, P for population, or just pop for population. We start out with 10,000 and we can add 500 for each year. So this is going to make it much easier for us to figure out these calculations. For five years, I can substitute five in for t. 500 times five would be 2,500, which would give us, what, uh, 2,500 plus 10,000. So how about we do years and population so after five years, we would have 12,500 in the population. Maybe about right there. After 10 years, we would multiply 500 people by 10. We would get 5,000 plus the original 10,000 would be 15,000 people. Right in the middle there. And then 17,500 and then 20,000. It would take 20 years for population of constant town to reach 20,000. And I'm just going to use a little bit of uh, math skills here. I know if I jump four spaces to the right, I can jump one up. So I will jump four more spaces from the right here and jump one up. And say after 40 years, constant town would be at 30,000 people. All right, I'm going to connect all of these as best I can. There we go. So this is constant town. Now, as far as power town is concerned, we need to think a little bit differently. We need to multiply the original 10,000 people by the 0.05% that it will grow. And we will get that this is 500 people. But then we have to add it back into this. All right, so that's 10,500. Well, that seems very familiar. After year one, we had 10,500 people, just like in the constant town. But then I have to multiply this by point, uh, 0 0.05 and get a new number that's 525 and I need to add it here. And this just gets really, really monotonous. So after the second year, it'd be 11,025 people already. Look at that. Power Town after year two has more people than Constant Town. All right, so I don't want to keep multiplying by 0 0.05 and adding it in, and then multiplying by da, da, da. No, we get to use uh, exponential functions for this. Uh, so what we can just do instead is we can just keep multiplying, not by point, uh, 0 0.05, is we can multiply by 1.05. The 1 represents this initial value right here, and the 0 0.05 is the 5% that we will add to this. 
So if you multiply these two values together, you will automatically get the next number, 11576 people after year three. So we don't have to go back and add it in. We have done that already when we changed this zero to a one. All right. Uh, so if we carry this out for five years, we will end up having some sort of an equation that looks like the population is 10,000, the original amount, times 1.05, to the t power where t is time. And in both cases here with the constant town and the power town, the population is the dependent variable and the time is the independent variable. And again, you could see that down here, the time being in years is on the x-axis and the uh, population in thousands is on the y-axis, the dependent and or independent and dependent axis. All right, so let's do a few calculations here. Um, we already figured out, or we already know, that if time is just starting, we are starting out at uh, ten thousand people. But five years later, we will have 12,762, which is just slightly above this black dot here. Ten years later, there will be 16,288, a little bit further above this dot. So you can already see the difference between the black dots and the blue dots is growing the difference meaning the gap between these so at 15 years there will be 20,789 and the gap between these dots is getting bigger and then after 20 years I'll get one more number up here for you it is 26,532 now I'm going to take this as far as I can go uh, to the right. Eventually, with the power town, the graph will just end up off the y coordinate because the numbers will keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so let me go all the way out to 40 years and see where that gets us. There will be 70,400 people in power town. So power town has got this very weird exponential growth where the longer this graph exists the faster it's going to be growing so power towns population is going to boom year over year whereas constant town just kind of steadily grows and it's kind of boring exponentials are really cool functions so let's take a look then at a little bit of this information, a little bit uh, in words. We have linear growth occurs when a, con when a quantity grows by the same constant rate, whereas exponential growth Uh, occurs when a quantity grows by the same percentage. So linear and exponential can also be applied to quantities that decrease with time, or we would use the word decay. But the main takeaway here is that linear growth uh, occurs when a quantity grows by the same constant rate. And just like you saw up here, we would just keep adding, 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 adding. Exponential growth occurs when a quantity grows by the same percentage. And you saw uh, at the beginning of this exercise, it grows by 5% each year. All right. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple examples. And we just want to state whether it is growth 
decay, exponential or linear. So we just have to make a couple choices here. Uh, pick one, growth or decay, and then linear or exponential. So first example, example A, the number of students at Wilson High School has increased by 50 in each of the past four years. If the student population was 750 four years ago, what is it today? So we have to figure out here, uh, is it linear or exponential? Well, in this case, it would be linear because there is no percentage given. All right, so here, this tells us this would be linear. Then we have to figure out if it's either growth or decay. Well, increased would be a word that helps us understand that it would be growth. And in the linear world, growth means addition. So from here, what we can do is we can create a little expression here we can say 750 is our initial amount. And we can set up the expression with the initial amount. Because it's growth, we will say plus. We want the growth factor, which is 50. And we would multiply that by t. So if we wanted to figure out what the population today was, we know that it was four years ago, so our t would be replaced with four. So 750 plus 50 times four is 750 plus 200, which is 950 students. And we have a few more examples of this on the next slide. So similar instructions from the previous slide, we need to figure out if it is growth or decay, and we need to figure out if it's exponential or linear. So here we go. We have the price of milk has been rising 3% ooh, percent per year. And if the price of milk, uh, let's see was four dollars a year ago what is it now so we have our number here our number is three percent that tells me that this will be exponential and then we have the descriptor rising does that mean this would be growth or decay rising would mean growth then we can figure this out if the price of a gallon of milk was $4 a year ago, what is it now? What we can do for exponentials is we can take the initial value, which was $4, and we can multiply it by 1 plus the rate and raise that to the time, the number of years. So the rate is 3%, which is 0 0.03. So this would look like this, four times 1.03, and the number of years is one. It was just a year ago. So when you multiply all of this out, you'll get $4.12. Part C. Tax law allows you to depreciate the value of your equipment by $200 per year. If you purchased the equipment three years ago for $1,000, what is its depreciated value today? So we know this will be linear because we do not have a percentage. Will this be growth or decay? The word that leads you to knowing whether it is growth or decay is this word right here, depreciate. 
and depreciate shows that it will decay. Depreciate just means the value will go down, and down is a decay. So since this is linear, we already know that we can set up our expression being the initial amount, that's how much you bought it for. But since this is decay now, this means subtract. And we will be subtracting the yearly rate times the number of years. Since this was uh, bought, three years ago, we know that t would be 3, so our expression would look like this, 1000 minus 200 times 3, which is 1000 minus 600 when you multiply 200 by 3, and you get $400 at the end. That's how much your equipment is worth today. For example D, we have the memory capacity of state-of-the-art computer storage devices is doubling approximately every two years. If a company's top-of-the-line drive holds 16 terabytes today, what will it hold in six years? Now, this one, we don't get a percentage or a rate at how this is growing as far as a number is concerned. We're not given a number, but we are given this word here, doubling. And that one word serves two purposes. If something doubles, it is getting bigger. So we know this will be growth. And if something doubles, that also tells us that it is increasing by the same percent each time, which means this would be exponential. So here we would have exponential growth. Now here's the funny thing. The other part that you have to keep very close track of is that it doubles approximately every two years and that it will, uh, we're trying to figure out how much the drive holds in six years. So if it takes two years to double, let me write this out. If it takes two years to double and we wait, we wait six years, how many times will it double? Well, for six years, it will double three times. So in order to figure out what this drive here will grow to, we just need to double that number three times. So 16 to be doubled would be 32. 32 doubled would be 64, and 64 doubled would be 128 terabytes. So doubling is exponential, just like we would say halving or quartering or quadrupling. Those all represent percents, and therefore they represent exponential uh, functions. Example E. The price of a high-definition TV sets have been falling by about 25% per year. If the price is $1,000 today, what can you expect it to be in two years? So again, we just have to check very quickly. I can see the word falling and I see a specific number here, 25%. So this is exponential for sure, and uh, falling means this will be decay. And decay for exponential functions also means we will subtract, but not in the way you think. 
So we can start with our original value. We would have one and our rate 0.25, so it'd be 0 0.25, and two years. So everything else about this feels like the exponential formula that we have been working with. You can see it back here as well. The initial amount times one plus the rate raised to some power of time. One, ooh, but we're decaying this time. This would be minus 0 0.25. The only reason this was plus up here is because we were talking about growth. So this relates then over into 1000 times 0 0.75 to the second power, which gives you $562.50. And that's how much uh, the price of the high-definition TV set would cost in about two years. So as I jump down the page here, we are going to return to our initial question. Would you rather have a million dollars right now or have one penny on the first day? After the first day, after one day passes, you get two pennies. After three days uh, sorry, two days pass, you get four pennies. After three days pass, eight cents, so on, so on, so on. And it's important to remember here that this is how much time has passed, these uh, amounts here. So the very first day, right when you get your very first penny, no time has passed. That's when it starts. And so it's important to remember that any non-zero number raised to the zero power is one. So we're just looking at, at this two to the zero power as a one, and that's why uh, one penny times one is one penny. So we can see the pattern here. After one day passes, you'll get two pennies. After two, day, two days pass, you'll get four pennies, so on, so on, so on. Here is the pattern to figure out how much you will earn after so many days. So if nine days have passed, you will get 0 0.01 times 2 to the ninth power. And we can do this for all of these 0 0.01 times 2 to the 16th power, 0 0.01 times 2 to the 23rd power. You guys get the idea. So if you run these through a calculator, you'll see that on the ninth day, you will end up with $5.12 from the previous day. Like the, the king will give you, or you will end up with a new $5.12. On the 16th day, you get $655.36. On the 23rd day, you'll end up getting $83, uh, sorry, $83,886.08. And then on the 30th day, you get a whopping $10,737,418.24. I don't think the 24 cents would really matter at that point, but that is a ton of money, $10 million for 30 days. So if you could show some patience, you would end up getting $10 million on that last day. In this question, this is so much fun. If we kept doubling, it would only take 51 days to be able to pay off the national debt. So if we just took a look at that one for a second, 0 0.01 times 2 to the 51 is approximately 22.5 times 10 to the 12 power, which is $22.5 trillion. And I'm wondering if we are still below that in the year 2020 here when I record this video. 
One other thing that I want to mention again is that this formula here only tells you how much money you earn for that particular day. So on the 30th day, you would get this 10 million, almost $11 million payout. But this number does not include all of the money that you made on the previous 29 days. So there's another formula that I will put up here in a second that shows you the total amount of money that you would make after 30 days or after 23 days or 16 days. And I want to put this up here very quickly so you can see uh, exactly how much money you would have at the end of 30 days. So the total amount for T days that you would have would look a little bit different than this. We would add one to the exponent and then subtract one from that new total and then multiply it by the original penny. So after 30 days, it would look something like this. 0 0.01, 2 to the 31, right? We have to add 1 to the number of days that we uh, have already, minus 1. And this would be approximately 21.5 million dollars. So again, this formula is used to figure out how much is earned for that particular day. But if you go back and fill this table in all the way out to 30, and you go back and add up all those values, it should be near 21.5 million. And that is a much better deal than uh, taking $1 million right now. For our next example, we can uh, look at bacteria in a bottle. Suppose you place a single microscopic bacterium into a bottle at 11 a.m. The bacterium grows rapidly, and at 11.01, it divides so that there are two bacteria in the bottle. These bacteria grow and divide at the same rate, so at 11.02, there are four bacteria in the bottle, and 11.03, there are eight bacteria in the bottle, and so on. Suppose after one hour of this growth pattern, the bacteria fill a one liter bottle. The number of bacteria at this point must be, well, since we're doubling here, we know this will be uh, two, uh, because that is how you double things, you multiply them by two. And since we are growing for one hour, and that being 60 minutes, and it is much more important to have this in terms of minutes because the bacteria double each minute. From 11 to 11.01, there it doubled. From 11.01 to 11.02, it doubled. 11.03, it doubled. So we will raise this to the 60th power. And what this is equivalent to is 1.15 times 10 to the 18th power. Or in words, would be 1.15 quintillion bacteria. Whoops, no dollar sign. 1.15 quintillion bacteria. This doesn't get used very often. I had to look this word up. Then we have a bacterial disaster on our hands. Because the bacteria have filled the bottle, the entire bacterial colony is doomed. The disaster occurred because the bottle was completely full at 12. When was the bottle half full? Well, since it takes one minute for the population to double, if we start here at 12 and we know that the bottle was full, if we travel backward one minute, that means it would be half full. So at 11... 
59, the bottle was half full. To think about it the other way, you would have to double half to get the full bottle in one minute. So it makes sense that at 11.59 it was half full. So that being said, imagine you are a mathematically sophisticated bacterium and at 11.56 you recognize the impending disaster. You immediately jump on your soapbox and warn that unless your fellow bacteria slow their growth dramatically, the end is just four minutes away. Will anyone believe you? So from the last scenario, at 12 we know the bottle is full, and at 11.59 it is half full, and we can keep this pattern going if we just keep multiplying by one half. So at 11.59, 58 at 11, 57, and at 11, 56. If we keep multiplying by half, we know it'll be a quarter full at 11, 58. It'll be one eighth full at 11, 57, and it'll be one sixteenth full at 11, 56. And no, probably not many people are going to believe you. And to go on a very short COVID-19 rant, this is why most people don't understand uh, why there are travel restrictions and physical distancing and the stuff happening because people don't understand how exponential growth works inherently. So if you are your mathematically sophisticated bacterium and you are at 11.56, you have a lot of room in that bottle still. You're at uh, 15 sixteenths yet, yet to fill. And no, people will probably be looking around and say, no, we've got plenty of room, relax, we've got all the time in the world. Uh, but you knowing math now, know that that won't work. All right, so the next question is, and the final question for this one, how many bottles would, fill, would the bacteria fill at the end of the second hour? So here we go. We know at 12 noon, one bottle is full. So if we go to 12.01, that means two bottles. When we can keep going, keep going, da, 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 and we would have to do this 60 times. And we've already done this 60 times. That was one of our calculations way back at the beginning. If we did this 60 times, when you double something 60 times, it would be 2 to the 60th power, which again would be that 1.15 quintillion bottles. And that is way too many bottles. So slow your growth, bacteria. Example 3. From hero to headless, uh, legend has it that when chess was invented in ancient times, a king was so enchanted that he said to the inventor, name your reward. So the inventor said, if you please, king, put one grain of wheat on my first square of my chessboard, then place two grains on the second square, four grains on the third square, and so on. The king gladly agreed, thinking the man a fool. This question ends up being uh, very much like the penny question we did a couple slides ago. So again, any non-zero number raised to the zero power is, uh, sorry, is one. There we go. And this gets to the little formula I was talking about before. Uh, the grains on the square would be 2 to the 63rd power, but the total 
is you add one more you add one more and then subtract one from the whole thing there. So using the table, how many grains would there be put on the 64th square? So this question is asking for this number, the total number of grains on that particular square. And that would be a lot. It would be a nine comma, I'm gonna to try to fit this number on here. 9 comma 22 So however you would say this. And so the total number of grains on the chessboard would be it would be more than a lot. I mean, it, it, here's the number. Here's the number for that second question. It is huge. So this is, this is it. This is 18 quintillion grains of wheat. Um, so here we have if one grain weighs one seven thousandth of a pound, how many pounds of grain were on the chessboard and the following squares were filled? Uh, really, I'm just interested in this one. So if I come along here and divide this by seven thousand, then we will have our answer. I'll write that number up here. It would be this many. Are we still in quintillion? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is two quadrillion, so this would be about 2.63 quadrillion pounds. And it's just, it's too much. I'll put some other numbers here so you can see what it would be here, here, and here. So here are the other poundages for these days. So on the 13th day, the king is probably still uh, smitten. Uh, this guy's only getting 1.2 1. pounds of wheat for me. And then on day 20, 149, almost 150 pounds. And on day 32, the 32nd square, that's only halfway through the chessboard. 613,000 pounds of wheat grains. That is just way too much. In fact, this number is larger. This number over here is larger than the total number of grains of wheat harvested in all of human history. The king never finished paying the inventor and according to legend, just instead had the inventor beheaded. It's just easier to deal with your problems if you kill him. All right. Uh, one last thing here, some key facts about exponential growth is that exponential growth leads to repeated doublings and exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely. Only after a relatively small number of doublings, exponentially growing quantities reach impossible proportions. And this lends itself over into what we call the logistic curve, which is something in math where it looks like it starts growing exponentially, but then it sort of flattens out at the end. Uh, so we would call this a logistic curve. And this is more, this is also very uh, useful in the real world, uh, but that's for another place and another time. I hope this video helps you understand uh, exponential growth as well as linear growth. Good luck.